Jesse Morrison is not here? She couldn't. So we will not have the presentation. Okay. And are you able to comment about the subject of the research or? Uh, yeah, I mean, we can talk about it. Okay. Because, well, welcome to this session. Uh, my name is Fernando. I will, will moderate this session. Uh, originally, we had a schedule uh, eight presentations, but we have got uh, five just five plus the one that we're talki talking about. So um, I need to keep the schedule, the timetable. Um, so in the case of the first presentation, so JC Morrison will give, uh, will talk, will yeah. comment about this uh, subject because the, the original present um, research is not here. So the title of that presentation was a screening annual ryegrass for increased uh, tolerance to blast, uh, Pediculina, Pedicularia orisae. Okay, so we have a 10 minute split. Okay. All good. <laughs> well, um, it's kind of like a stand up hour. Um, so, Go ahead, yeah. Fire away. Uh, resistance, I'll, I'll say no. We haven't split any of the varieties we've included in trials into diploid and tetraploid. So what we started following was a paper that Ali Masawi at, at UGA published, and I don't know, four or five, six years ago, something like that. Um, he had a graduate student. I say he published, his graduate student published. Uh, I'm just not familiar with the student. Um, I think they had 170 accessions that they screened um, at, <coughs> excuse me, um, they had 200,000 spores from, per milliliter of these solutions they applied um, at, the, at, at three weeks old, four weeks old, something like that. Um, they saw no difference in ploidy they had serious injury on all of their plants, but they had two varieties that stood out as being fairly tolerant. Um, Vertil, which is an old French variety, it's a diploid, and OR34, um, which is never, is, is still just a germplasm line. So we got seed from both of those. Um, OR34 turned out to be really turf type, compact, dark green, thin leaved, ugly from a forage perspective. So after the first year, we, we threw it out. So we essentially screened Vertil for tolerance, and we used, so Marshall is a popular diploid annual ryegrass variety from uh, Mississippi State, um, it's incredibly old. Um, we, there's been some interest in improving it from the university's perspective, so we've been selecting Marshall lines for different purposes. Um, we have one who, uh, Eric Billman, I think, might be talking at the end of this session. Um, he, he, during his PhD work, he worked on developing heat tolerant um, Marshall, essentially. So we took our heat tolerant germplasm and any germplasm from Vertil that we could uh, find that tolerated 200 to 300,000 spores per milliliter um, and just allowed them to cross. And so that was my graduate student, this was her project. So she got two generations of seed harvested and had done one progeny screening, essentially. Um, she, had, she had reliable results while she had, a, she had two inoculations that didn't seem to, Eric, speak of the devil, there he is. Uh, she had two inoculations that didn't seem to go very well, nothing responded. Um, but she killed a lot of plants, she killed a lot of vertical plants. Um, I, I think the best um, heritability figures she could she could come up with were somewhere between 0.2 and 0.3 for Vertil. Um, we had high heritability for heat tolerance in the lines that Eric had developed, um, but she had her first progeny screening of crosses between heat tolerant germplasm and blast tolerant Vertil um, that she had just screened. 
So what she did, she we we had a hard time just getting our own from around where we were. So what we had was a culture from a researcher at Rutgers that was grown on tall fescue, I think. So we brought it infected annual ryegrass plants and recultured that race. So I, we didn't go to any lengths to identify it or differentiate it from anything else. It was just one of the few that we could get our hands on. So we didn't push temperatures much above during like the inoculation procedure. Uh, we never pushed temperatures much above like 90, maybe it was the low 90s, somewhere between 85 and 95 is where we tried to keep plants while we were inoculating them. Um, so we never pushed temperature far and we haven't included both of those factors in like a, a co-selection process. But I imagine that is, is coming down the road at some point. Uh, uh, the question is uh, whether the Yes, we on, we only screened it at yeah three to six weeks. Um, I, I honestly haven't. This is my first foray into into working with blast, so we haven't inoculated any plants beyond the the very young vegetative stage. Um, what we did see in Vertil overwhelmingly was uh, was like hypersensitivity. Um, large concentrated cell death, um, sometimes like leaf abortion. But I can tell you when we had issues with spore production and our seedlings were older, eight weeks, 12 weeks, um, we had to work really, really hard just to get infection. We had to increase spore counts four or five times. Um, we had to really stress plants just to get a response. So I can't I can't speak to what it would be like at like a reproductive stage. Any other questions, comments? Barry. And for a while, we we doubted the the virulence overall of the the um, the culture that we had in general. So our only and the the papers again. I wish Kaylin were here to talk about it. She could she could give you more of the the details. Um, the papers we could find were widely varied in the concentration of spores they used in their inoculation solutions. So when we found papers that went up to you know 300. 400,000 spores per milliliter. We had started at 50. So our best idea was just to push it as high as, as, as was, you know, accepted in the literature and see what response we got. Um, and while we did tend to, I mean, we killed more plants, which I was happy about. Um, once they got to a certain age, it just wasn't worth screening them anymore. Yes.
Yeah. I'm sorry. Say, say that again. Yeah. Yes. Oh, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Detaching the leaves. Um, gosh. That might be why they ended up actually detaching the leaves because they did the They had, so they had the I'm trying to I'm trying to remember the name of the paper of the year it came out. But so they they did have they had two or two or maybe three procedures they used in that paper. So they they had they used like the the little like stainless steel ready racks and they put you know covers over them and and put um, steam um, units in there so we we tried to mimic that same thing with with whole plants um, that was that that was where we kind of stole our, our design idea from yeah Well, we actually we got lucky, and we, we uh, in in the basement of Dorman now we've got this bank of, of six new growth chambers, oh, so okay. so we we begged to get to the front of the line to use them. Um, so we got to work the kinks out of them for one, but we also got to have enough space for um, Kaylin to have pretty much all the plants she wanted in there. Yeah. yeah. So so her first just like you did her first two inoculations we did in the greenhouse with this like contrived thing of plastic and, and and hoop structures and shade cloth and and humidifiers and yeah and it was just it was really difficult to control anything in there. Okay, the room no and Edna Anthony okay so we will have to wait two minutes now Okay, we welcome Swumin Wang. Uh, the title of his presentation is Overexpression of ZXABC G11 from Sigophyllum santosylum Impl improves yield of alfalfa by enhancing tolerance to drought and heat. Please go ahead. Thanks, Dr. to give me the opportunity to introduce our work. About the over expression of the, the gene ZXIPCG11 
from a desert plant uh, to improve the yield of the alfalfa uh, by increasing the stress tolerance. As we know, alfalfa play an important role uh, in the livestock production. So the demands for alfalfa has shown dramatic increase in China in recent years. Therefore, there is a huge shortfall between the, the, between the yield and the, the demand. Uh, alfalfa planting area uh, increased in recent years, and uh, about 70% uh, of them planted uh, in the northwest uh, China. And this region uh, belong to the arid and uh, semi-arid regions. But the existing alfalfa cultivar is a high, so high, high water consumption crops and with uh, the weak stress tolerance to, to, uh, to the various stresses. Therefore, it is necessary to generate alfalfa cultivars with drought and uh, heat tolerance. It is reported that the cultivar wax can protect uh, plants from high temperature and drought stress. And many researchers uh, indicated that the desert plant, the phylum, uh, possesses thick cuticle, uh, which can protect, uh, pre prevent the water loss via the surface of, of, of the plant. Uh, but uh, demonstrated that APCG 11 involved in the export of cuticular lipids from the epidermal cells. Our previous results indicated that UV expression of APCG11 could uh, increase the tolerance um, to drought in the model plant arabidopsis. So it uh, is possible that the APCG11 could uh, use to improve the, the important forage alfalfa. Next, I will introduce our work about this research. Uh, we use the epidermal specific uh, promoter, uh, Arbidopsis uh, 6 as a promoter to drive the ABCG11 from the desert plant into alfalfa and uh, obtained uh, 10 positive lines. Then we use the uh, highest uh, uh, expression level of the APCG11, the, the UV pressure line two and line, line, uh, line nine for the further analysis. We can see uh, the UV expression lines uh, have the large leaf areas and also the large number of crystal number, and also the uh, thick cuticular uh, thickness is, is much higher than the wire type. We also uh, evaluated the uh, stress tolerance of the transgenic uh, alfalfa. Uh, we can see either under the control condition or under the uh, drought condition, the transgenic uh, alfalfa have big, uh, large areas and a higher uh, plant height. O also, the shoot and uh, root, uh, dry weight and uh, fresh weight uh, is higher than the wild type. Uh, same as the uh, drought treatment. Uh, the transgenic uh, alfalfa also e exhibited uh, enhanced uh, heat tolerance than the wild type. Uh, 
Uh, also, we can see from the uh, root, uh, root uh, dry at the fresh bed. Uh, then we analyze the, the, the accumulation of cuticular wax on the leaf surface. We can see uh, have more the uh, cuticular wax in the transgenic lines than the uh, wild type. We also analyzed the, the component uh, of the, uh, the wax. Uh, we can see uh, in the alpha, the, the predominant uh, the component is the primary al alcohol. Uh, and also under the control or, or drought conditions, the transgenic line have the higher wax load than the wire type. Also under the heat treatment, we can see uh, the transgenic uh, lines uh, same as the drought treatment, have the much higher uh, primary alcohol and also the total uh, wax load. Mm, the leaf water loss and the chlorophyll leaching is the two important uh, indexes for evaluate the QD Cuticle, cuticle permeability. We can see these two indexes is uh, much lower than the wild type uh, under the control, especially under the drought condition in the wild, uh, transgenic uh, lines than the wild type. Also, we can see under heat treatment, uh, the water loss and the chloroph chlorophyll leaching is lower uh, than, the, uh, than the, the control condition. But also the transgenic li uh, lines is much lower than the wild type. So we, can, we concluded that over expansion of ZXABCG11 reduces the cuticular permeability thereby effectively decreases the non dormant water loss. We also evaluated the field performance of the transgenic lines in the desert area. Uh, in the Gansu the Minqing County. Uh, this area is surrounded by the Tenga and uh, but then dragon deserts. The annual preci precipitation is below than uh, 200 mm, and the maximum uh, temperature is uh, up in, in the summer reached to the 40, 40 degree centigrade. We can see after uh, growing the, the plant uh, in the field uh, after 50 days, uh, the plant uh, growth is much better than the, the wild type, the plant height uh, at the leaf area. We also, un under the longer, 95 day, uh, five days, the same as, the, uh, as the before. We also can see uh, the transgenic uh, alfalfa about the, the high yield increased about 50%. Uh, uh, so we concluded that the UV expression of the ADCG 11 notably reduced the cuticle permeability by increasing cuticle wax deposition. Uh, we, which contributed uh, to the increased uh, water retention at the photosynthesis capacity of the transgenic alfalfa, thereby resulted in the in, in, uh, enhancement of biomass yield as well as drought and heat tolerance. Also, our results uh, illustrated that the zeophytes can be considered as a potential genetic resources 
for the improvement of, of forage. Thank my uh, PhD students, uh, Lin Bo Liu and uh, Ye Tian, and also my colleagues, Professor Bo, and also thank the financial support from the OSSC. And also thank our collaborator, Professor Uwe Roland and Professor Shirley Hepworth from Carleton University, Canada. Thanks for your attention. Thanks. Thank you very much, Suomin. We have plenty of time for questions. Please. Sorry. Oh, for equality. Uh, yeah, yes. Uh, the, the, the quality is the same as the wire type. But uh, we we not sure the data in this. Yeah. More questions? Now this is in the process. Sorry? Uh, this work uh, in the process. Yes. This work. So how many years have you been in the field? Uh, how many years in the field? Yeah. Uh, uh, just uh, one year. Okay. In the, in the Uh, we just uh, conducted one year, but uh, oh, the right. con continue, continual work, uh, uh, the work con continued in, in that now. More questions? What's the natural variation of cuticle layer in alfalfa? Is it the lines between the wild types or between the cuticle wild types? You mean the cuticle is the wild type of alfalfa? Correct. Yeah. Uh, that that is uh, very few, very few. Yeah, we we can see from. Maybe. We have plenty of time because the next speaker is yeah, not yeah. in the room. So, please go ahead with details. Daniel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we just do that work. Yeah. Data are, are not shown. Yeah, yeah, not should here yet. Not yet. Yeah, we, we just evaluate that. Um, but the, the, the wax increased. That is not, uh, not good uh, for, for feeding. Yeah. The, because the wax increased. But the protein and the other nutrition element, uh, no, no, no difference. Because in China, you don't know that China, the drought always accompany with heat. Yeah. Yeah. We need to uh, uh, grow the alfalfa in the drought areas. Yeah. Any other question? 
just a general question. Can you use transgenic plants in, in cultivars in China? Not yet. Not yet? Yeah. Okay. So are you planning to, to, to use, use this as a basic general platform for future crosses? Or? Yeah, it yeah, yeah. Should, should, should be open soon because China export uh, a huge amount of soybean from the, uh, the USA or Brazil. Okay. More questions or comments? We have 15 minutes <laughs> left, so <laughs> please go ahead. Okay, if not, Thank you. Please, please give an applause to. <laughs> we have to wait for 15 minutes, so please have water. I, I don't have coffee to offer to, offer to you, but <laughs> you can have water. <laughs>
Okay, so before we start again, last chance, is Edna Anthony in the room? Edna Anthony is not in the room? No? Okay. So we welcome uh, Matt Francis. The title of his presentation will be Prospects for Improving Alfalfa Yield Using Genomic and Phenomic Based Breeding. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Matt Francis. I'm a PhD student at the University of California, Davis, working in Charlie Brummer's lab. And today I'm going to present to you prospects for improving alfalfa yield using genomic and phenomic based breeding. So just a quick outline of the talk today. So I'll um, give you a little rundown on the current state of alfalfa yield improvement and production in the United States. Um, and then a few methods that we're using, using modern breeding tools to address the lack of yield gain. So that's genomic selection and remote sensing. And then a few uh, recommendations if you want to imp uh, implement remote sensing in your breeding program. And then just a final summary. So taking a look at the uh, <coughs> alfalfa production in the US and particularly uh, in, the, in the western US. So production area, you can see it reached a peak in about the 1960s and it's been in a fairly steady decline nationally and a stark decline in California in the last 20 years. Um, and then on top of that, uh, on-farm hay yields, so this, all, this data is from the um, USDA, the National Agricultural Statistics Service. So there has been no improvement in yield for the last 30 years really, um, both nationally and in California. So why is that? So there has been a focus on other traits such as improving pest and disease resistance, forage nutrient value and stand persistence and breeding programs have made good progress in these areas. Um, but perhaps we're not selecting appropriately for forage yield. So uh, in alfalfa typical breeding programs, early generation trials use space plant nurseries, um, family rows um, and these aren't exactly representative of what the farm is seeing in commercial fields, um, so perhaps we're not actually evaluating yield appropriately. Um, that's bre uh, breeding programs are using some outdated statistical anal analysis uh, methods, so not appropriate uh, accounting for spatial variation appropriately or temporal and genetic correlation between families. Um, and the next thing, yield is a complex trait, so um, it's low heritability and uh, whole bunch of genes are working towards that, so it's hard to make progress in these in this areas, but other crops have seen progress made in these areas, so there's no reason why we can't do that in alfalfa. Um, another thing, the perennialty of alfalfa it has long selection cycles, so typical breeding trials are running you know, three years, you're taking um, a lot of measurements over that pro uh, period, so it can uh, impact your rate of genetic gain. And lastly, there's a lack of breeding and limited testing resources, which isn't being helped by the decrease in acreage and the lack of yield improvement that we're seeing. So what is the solution? So in our breeding program, we're looking at using mini sward plots and some modern breeding technology, so genomic selection and remote sensing to try and address this issue. So in 2020, we established some yield tri trials in Davis, California. Uh, these were established in May um, in two locations. Each location has two reps, and we established them in 24 plant mini sward plots. And so this is to try and get a better, uh, increased competition within families and try to get a better read on um, yield in the that's more typical on farm and within this trial we have 193 house of families that are from UC Davis elite populations as well as a few repeated checks and cultivars in there and so the purpose of this trial is threefold so it's a continuation of the UC Davis elite alfalfa breeding program um, and we're implementing genomic, genomic selection in this so we're not just growing a separate uh, training population this isn't a separate trial this is just part of the regular breeding program and then it's also a proof of concept for remote sensing um, which I'll get to later in the talk and so as far as phenotypic data, here we have three harvests in 2020, the establishment year, seven in 2021, and three in 2022. But we're really looking at trying to improve yield potential. So we're just focusing on those seven harvests in 2021. And so we have that data, all the phenotypic analysis is done on just that first year data because as you move into the second and third years, uh, we believe that sort of um, uh, res uh, resistance to sort of biotic and abiotic factors become an issue that uh, adding to the yield potential of those uh, high-performing families, but we're trying to just get a read on the yield potential of these varieties. Uh, so the trial was managed under uh, high input, so it was flood irrigated, which is typical in uh, Western US, um, and it was, there was no limiting factors, so uh, this is high-yielding alfalfa with sort of seven to eight cuts. So there, this is an area we're growing sort of eight to nine full dormancies, so these are, uh, this is an intensively run alfalfa production producing really high yields. Uh, so just a little background on genomic selection for those that need the refresher. So genomic selection is a form of marker-assisted selection that utilizes genetic markers distri distributed across the entire genome to calculate GBVs. 
And so we used GBS in this uh, study and we found about 500,000 SNPs and that was reduced to about 40,000 after quality filtering. And so an important difference here to perhaps some other programs is that we're using, uh, we're interested in half subfamily performance, not individual performance. So uh, we genotype families by pooling individuals together and then we're looking at allele frequencies. And so we developed a relationship matrix based on allele frequencies um, of these half subfamilies and so we're evaluating the, the whole family. And so the goal is to increase the rate of genetic gain by decreasing the time between generations. So we're going to run a few cycles of selection in the greenhouse um, and then hopefully make gain that way. And so just quickly, so some of the results for genomic selection. So this is just a breakdown of each individual harvest and an overall. So predictive availability ranges for each harvest. Uh, it's pretty common in alfalfa to see sort of lower predictive availability in those summer months when sort of you have that summer slump in yield. Um, but overall, we're sitting about a, a predictive availability around 0.3, which is fairly consistent among uh, other programs and forages. Um, but really, so we think we can make genetic gain with this level, but really we want to be pushing that number up higher. And so we're sort of looking at various ways to do that. I know Esteban, if you were at his talk, has uh, presented some ways to do that. And uh, one of the main ways is increasing the number of families. So we have 193 families in this uh, trial, and so really that's not enough to have high predictability. So we really need to push that up. So um, I'll get on to that shortly. So where we're at with this so far, so we made selections from the trial just last week, so we dug up, um, so we've almost three years to the day when the trial was planted. Uh, we went and selected the best plants visually from the top 10% of families after three years based on that first year yield. So we have the best families based on the first year yield and then we've gone in and selected plants that have persisted and looked, um, essentially we're just using a breeder's eye within those families we have selected the best plants to form populations. And then in addition, we're growing up 50 genotypes from the top 10% of families from this trial and then we're gonna use genomic selection to do a couple of cycles of selection in the greenhouse. And then we've also, just as a, a side, we've done a breeder's eye population where we've just gone through the trial and selected the best 20 plants from each rep to put together the plants that look the best after three years of constant cutting. And we've made some, we're gonna make a, a whole bunch of populations and then we're gonna establish a new breeding trial this fall. So shifting tack a little bit. So as I mentioned before, we have 193 half of families in this trial um, and ideally, I mean that's a low number for genomic selection so we really want to push that number up. Uh, but the, the biggest constraint we have is, uh, is labour. So to harvest and collect all that phenotypic data, the um, yield data and the quality assessment, dry matter information, so that requires a lot of work. And so remote sensing is a tool that we can use that can really bring down that uh, labour component and means we can scale up our trials and include more families. So um, just to, I'll just run you through how we actually extract uh, yield estimates using drones uh, for those that are potentially interested um, in using this in their breeding program. And so the important thing is, so we know we can get high accuracies between uh, remote sensing things using LiDAR and things, but um, as I mentioned, breeding resources are limited, so we're looking at sort of a lower cost method of estimating biomass using uh, what we have here is a 5, 000, about a $5,000 camera. It's a multispectral camera, and so we have this mounted to a drone. We're flying this over our trials and uh, estimating biomass. In our breeding program, we have sort of three main types of plots. So we have the uh, row plots, which are used in a lot of early generation trials, and then the best of those go on to these larger sown plots. And, um, and then at the bottom there, we have what we're trying now with these transplanted um, sword plots. And so to extract biomass estimates, the drone's flown 50 meters above the ground with images with an 80% overlap. We stitch these images together to form an ortho mosaic, so just a single image using software such as Pix4D, or Open Drone Map is a newer software that's open source. Um, so bring those costs down again. Uh, from this data, we calculate uh, the normalized difference vegetation index, the NDVI, just with using the number for red bands and the red bands. It's a simple calculation. And then all that does is separate between soil and plant. So for this image, the white is the plant material, black is soil. And then we next overlay a grid over our plants like so, and we use a digital surface model, which is also calculated during that processing phase and essentially this is, is it has a relative height for every single pixel in that image and so it's as simple as just separating soil and plant and then calculating the plant height based on that. So we're just simply calculating biomass volume and correlating that with yield. And so here's some results. So initially on first look, I mean we have, you know, a, a somewhat of a weak correlation here. I mean, so you can see that the high biomass uh, High actual biomass varieties are higher uh, using the drone predictions. But when we dive into this, uh, we, there's ways to really increase this accuracy. So if we're looking at an individual harvest, so this was a harvest in August where there was a lot more variation, 
you can see that the accuracy is much, much better. And um, moving forward, there's a few recommendations I'll make that if you want to impl implement this in your breeding program on um, what you're going to use. And then also looking at rows, so I think a real uh, potential for using drones is uh, it does a really good job measuring plant height. And so the current method of uh, assigning full dormancy uses, is, uses plant height. So in these row trials, you can get a, a pretty good correlation there between um, biomass as well as plant height. And then just looking at the transplanted row plots, um, so there's a, you know, a, a decent correlation there again. But so none of these trials are established uh, specifically for using drones to estimate biomass. So I mean, we can already see there's some good correlations there. So some of the factors that affect the accuracy of using drones, um, so anything that affects the soil level or plant height can cause large discrepancies in the data. Um, things such as uh, animal damage, gophers, rabbits, ground squirrels can be a real pain, especially in uh, California in my trial. I've had some uh, real issues with these, these pests. So they, ra they can raise the soil level and affect your estimates that way. Um, lodging is another issue. Um, so obviously if you're measuring plant height, if there's lodging, then you're going to massively underestimate um, the value there. So moving back to that earlier plot, you can see the sort of these uh, points highlighted here. They have low estimates from the drone, but ha actually have high biomass. So that, that was due to lodging in that particular harvest. So some recommendations for remote sensing. So you need to begin with a very level seed bed. Um, that makes your data much more accurate if you have a, a nice flat surface when you're going in. Uh, straight lines make the processing steps much, much easier. So if you have your plots arrayed on a regular grid, then when you're coming in and analyzing it, it makes it a lot faster. If it's offset, then you have to do a lot of manual um, movement of plots in the, in the processing phase. You must have an area of soil level ground around each plot in order to get accurate estimates, whether this is bare soil or whether you're mowing lines between your plots. Um, it's, it doesn't really matter. We get accurate sort of estimations each way. And then you need pest and weed control, so that's sort of linking back to the soil height and to the um, estimation of yeah, forage and soil and partitioning that. So just in summary, so there has been a lack of yield improvement in alfalfa, which I believe modern breeding methods and technology can help to address. Uh, there is a need to evaluate more families to increase our GS accuracy, but labour can be a, main con a major constraint in that area, but drones can be helpful. Uh, I believe a hybrid system with larger trials utilizing remote sensing where a subset of, plot are har subset of plots are harvested and the remainder estimated using drones um, can be used. So you can scale up your trials and get the, the best out of this data. And Esteban's team's done some work on sort of optimizing that and it's a better way of optimizing your resources, essentially. And then also, I didn't really get into it in this talk, but utilizing modern statistical methods to extract the most out of our breeding trials, we we're accounting appropriately for spatial variation, temporal and genetic correlations between individuals and families. Um, I'd also I'd just like to uh, thank a few organisations and people uh, that helped put this research together. So PG Rights and Seeds, Grasses Innovation and DLF for sponsoring my PhD and working with Charlie and over in UC Davis. Um, and then some members of the Brummer Lab and Travis Parker for help flying the drone to collect this data. Uh, happy to take any questions if I've got time. Questions? Derek? Um, I've looked at some other uh, areas, so there's a, a group in Blueberry that had a nice plot sort of showing it um, asymptoting. So they had, I think their lowest was 120, then 250, and up to I think 500 was where they started getting within that range of um, appropriate areas. But I'd, yeah, I'd say 500 to 1,000 families I think would be sort of the minimum area where you want to be. Daniel? Yeah, that's a, so as you can see from some of the photos of this trial, there's not a ton of variation there. So we're working with uh, eight and nine dormancy, full dormancy around that range. Um, so all these fams are from two very closely uh, related populations. Um, and yeah, I think that's where the, the statistical analysis of trials comes in, where we really have to be able to make sure we're picking out the differences between these. I mean, we have an abundance of data. We, we're lucky that we ha we're able to sort of have repeated measurements on these plots and things where we can get a lot of data, but we need to really account for the spatial and temporal variation there. Um, but it, it, yeah, it is tough. It's, it's a, a real problem when you're starting to get into these elite um, 
breeding trials of elite lions and populations. Okay, we have time for one short question and short answer, please. Yeah, uh, I can say about, so we've used it on grass plots, which are a little more prostrate, and we have uh, pretty similar prediction accuracies across large plots. I think it was about, R squared of about 0.7. But um, yeah, certainly when you get more prostrate, your accuracies are going to go down. It's great for erect plants, but yeah, perhaps you need some other methods to use for remote sensing for prostrate plants. Right, thank you. So now we welcome Esteban Rios. His presentation will will be plant breeding perspectives for alfalfa and some other species. Well, yeah, I, I made some changes in my presentation because I presented on Monday just alfalfa, so I decided to highlight other crops and other parts of the, my breeding program. Um, I hope that's okay with most of you. I think most of you were in the presentation on Monday, and some of the work we're doing in alfalfa is very similar to what Matt presented, so I will try to build from, from there. Uh, my name is Esteban Rios. I'm an assistant professor in the agronomy department at the University of Florida, and I um, run the, the forage breeding program uh, in Gainesville. Uh, so I slightly changed the title. Uh, so plant breeding perspective from improving forages in warm climates. Uh, I think I'm gonna use this. So I'll w walk through uh, my program, basically um, showing you what are the current and, and sometimes f uh, future efforts uh, in these four steps. Uh, in terms of defining breeding objectives, we have a very large livestock industry in the southeastern United States, and our varieties basically uh, provide ecosystem services to multiple systems, uh, beef uh, and livestock, um, product, uh, sorry, beef and dairy production, uh, mostly are, or, or are the most important. Uh, this picture here in the middle is one of the dairy units close to Gainesville, this is one of my own farm trials uh, looking at interseeding uh, alfalfa into Bermuda grass. Uh, as you can see, the grass is dormant. So this picture was taken in January where the farmer wouldn't be, gr wouldn't be harvesting any forage in that land. Now we're incorporating alfalfa and the farmer can basically harvest uh, fresh forage year round. Um, so when we think about the environment that we are breeding for, uh, our uh, livestock industry is basically spread ac across the state and we have very contrasting environmental conditions in the south and in the north, uh, not only in terms of temperature, also in terms of drought and soil types. So my program basically breeds uh, multiple species, um, warm season and cool season, annuals and perennials and legumes and grasses. So we have a very broad uh, program looking at primarily yield, uh, not only total yield, but also yield distribution, uh, nutritive value and, and a couple of uh, abiotic and uh, biotic stresses. So one example for genetic variation, which is very important in order to make improvements in breeding. Uh, this is, we started a new cowpea breeding project uh, maybe four years ago, um, looking primarily to develop forage or cover crop type cowpeas uh, for our region. We are looking at phenology, yield, uh, and I will show you an example for nematodes as well. Uh, so in this trial, we had, or we are working with the UC Riverside Minicore collection. Uh, the largest germoplasm collection for cowpeas are lo uh, is located in IITA in Nigeria. They have 15,000 different accessions. Then they develop a, a core collection of 2,000, but it, that is still very large. So uh, folks at, at UC Riverside, they develop a Minicore that is about 384, and that's basically the germoplasm that we are working with. Uh, we have significant genetic variation for key traits, and this graph here on the, on, in the top represents day to flowering, so there is a really broad window uh, for flowering time in cowpeas, uh, and then that also translates into biomass production at flowering time. As we can see, there are two uh, breeding lines from the USDA that they are late flowering, and also they produce a good amount of biomass uh, looking at forage and also as a cover crop. And then we have performed some GWAS or GWAS analysis in order to look at pheno uh, phenological traits and also some um, seed parameters as well. In terms of um, root node nematodes, uh, we have very sandy soils in Florida and they are full of nematodes. 
And we have a very large um, ve um, vegetable industry. So basically, Florida provides uh, tomatoes, peppers, and, and many other veg vegetables during the winter time. So we need some uh, cover crops during the summertime. Uh, so when we screen this population for Melodogyne incognita, we saw that there are a, a really large number of accessions that are highly resistant. So we have germoplasm to breed for uh, nematode uh, resistance. And then this one in the right, they basically represent susceptible genotypes. Now, there is a new emerging root node nematode. As always, in Florida, there is always a new pest or disease. Uh, Melodogyne enterolobi, or the guava root node nematode, uh, that is affecting a lot of our vegetable crops. So now we, we screen this population for this new nematode, and the graph looks totally different. Most of the accessions were highly susceptible, but we were able to identify some resistant lines that will be used in our, um, in our program. And my new student, Habib, he will be developing uh, mapping populations to trace these genes. Uh, this is a success story looking at genetic variation. So this is a project in collaboration with Bill Anderson and other breeders from the southeastern United States. We basically tested the USDA collection uh, for Bermuda grass, trying to restart a new breeding program, but we already uh, released a variety out of that population. Uh, the new cultivar Newell was selected uh, out of the USDA collection. We tested that uh, at the Noble Foundation, North Carolina, uh, Tifton, and in various places in Florida. And we found that Newell, uh, and this is again a non-farm trial, Newell um, establishes faster than Tifton 85 using tops, and also has a better distribution of yield throughout the year. So it starts producing earlier and, um, and later in the season, also providing more opportunities for cuts for, for hay or for grazing. Uh, lately, uh, now, Starting next season, I will be taking over the annual ryegrass breeding program at UF. It used to be Dr. Ken Wardy, the breeder, but we will start uh, new projects. So Pablo, my, my PhD student, is looking at uh, genetic variation for annual ryegrass, uh, and we are developing some training populations for genomic selection as well. Uh, the third step is basically developing and selecting progeny, and this is where we spend most of the time in terms of uh, breeding or, or research, sorry, applied to breeding. Uh, we normally use very specific mating designs that allow us to conduct breeding studies, but also allows us to, to basically build new germoplasm uh, with uh, an applied perspective. And we did that in alfalfa, and as I mentioned, we are also doing that in annual ryegrass. Uh, we have a current project looking at about 250 Hapsi families uh, that we are phenotyping and genotyping to build genomic selection models as well. Uh, we are, of course, as Matt said, using high throughput or trying to implement high throughput phenotyping because, again, the goal to increase genetic gain, we believe that we need to use uh, larger population sizes, and in order to do that, we need to reduce costs uh, for labor. Um, and next week, just as a little bit of self-promotion, we are running a workshop on, um, as part of our grant from ACTUPI in order to show you how to uh, implement these uh, technologies in alfalfa. So a little bit of results. Uh, Matt already showed this, so I'm not going to explain. Bas basically, we have good correlation between yield and uh, remote sensing images. But now, uh, what I wanted to touch briefly, because Matt mentioned that, is um, what would be the genetic gain if we harvest less plots? So this graph here represents the percentage of herbage accumulation or ground-based measurements uh, that we have, and then genetic gain in the y-axis. So the 100 here represents the situation where you go and you harvest every single plot in your experiment, and then you have the remote sensing data. And then as you move to the left, it's basically reducing the amount of plots or the amount of data that you are collecting in your breeding program. We did that up to 30%, so basically reducing 70% of the labor, and we were able to obtain the same genetic gain by running bivariate models, so basically incorporating remote sensing and gr ground truth data. So this is really exciting news because it means that we can increase population size, use remote sensing, and hopefully increase genetic gain for complex traits. Uh, now a little bit of genomic selection. I'm not going to touch a lot of information because Matt already did that. We are observing very similar trends in terms of variability of predictive ability across harvest. I think it, this is exactly the same graph that you presented with a different germoplasm, and it's also non-dormant. 
Now what we did is we say, okay, how many harvests do we need in a given year to build a model that will allow us to predict future harvest? And the answer is we need about five to six. So if we harvest, you know, half of the time that we normally harvest in Florida, that which is between 10 to 11, uh, we can reduce 50% of the labor again, build the model and predict uh, total or future yields in, in the, 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 the future harvest. Uh, in terms of statistical analysis, as, as, as Matt mentioned, what we are trying to do now is, is incorporating envirotyping, that is basically uh, creating these uh, kernels with environmental and soil data that allow us to understand when plants are growing under stress or under non-stress, and we incorporate that into the genomic selection model. Uh, we have pretty good results. Uh, so this paper was published recently in the plant genome, uh, where my postdoc um, tested different models for yield and also for persistence. Uh, I don't have time to show you every single model, but look at GBLOB, that is basically just running genomic selection using molecular markers and ignoring any sort of genotype by harvest interaction and ignoring the environmental um, data that we have available. Uh, for yield, we have a decent predi predictive ability, but for persistence, we can have a good reliable uh, model if we don't incorporate G by E and if we don't model the environmental variables. Uh, look at the, f the, uh, the, at the next models that are incorporating those, uh, that information and then how predictive ability increases as we increase also the number of harvests. The bottom line is uh, for complex traits, we not only need genomic data, we also need to incorporate uh, multi-omics approaches in order to accelerate or increase genetic gain uh, for yield. Uh, in terms of future efforts, uh, Pablo is trying to incorporate crop modeling. Uh, we are working with Charlie Messina now. Uh, he's a faculty in, in, um, in Florida. So basically, Charlie and Mark Cooper developed these models for Corteva in order to develop Aquamax products. Uh, so what we are trying to do is work with uh, basically embryotyping uh, our target populations of environments where our germoplasm will grow in the future. Uh, we have large and extensive data sets from the northeast of uh, the U.S. This is basically the uh, historical variety trials that have been run in the U.S. And we are also working with, in collaboration with Daniel and Inta Argentina in order to do the same with their variety trials. Okay. Uh, lastly, releasing cultivars. So that's the focus of my breeding program. I, I'm doing, trying to do a lot of cool research, but at the end of the day, I would like to develop products for producers. Uh, in terms of disseminating cultivars, I'm, I'm very fortunate to be working with a lot of extension folks, not only in Florida, but in the southeastern United States, uh, that we are really working together to disseminate these improved cultivars. I also have interest in international work. Uh, we are doing some work with the Livestock Innovation Lab at UF, um, basically disseminating improved uh, tropical grasses in, in, in Burkina Faso and other countries in Africa. Uh, in terms of the release, I already mentioned the, the new uh, Bermuda grass cultivar. We also released a new alfalfa cultivar that uh, outyields commercial cultivars, at least in Florida, for at least three years. Uh, this is yield data and this is persistence. As you can see, Clever is uh, standing in this picture. Uh, here in the right, we have, in the left, sorry, we have our cultivar after three years. And then some other commercial standards uh, with lack of persistence, at least our in our environment. Um, we have a, a, a few new um, clovers, uh, Q clover in name of Dr. Quisenberry, uh, a 2,4-D resistant tetraploid, uh, sorry, diploid red clover. And I also uh, recently released a new early flowering crimson clover looking at forage, but also as a potential for cover crop. And Dr. Ann Blount just recently released a new ball clover uh, with the same intentions of, of either as a pasture or as a cover crop. Uh, as a summer annual uh, legume, uh, we have some projects with Ashinomini. I don't have data to show you because the two uh, years that we planted Ashinomini in this research farm, uh, you can see the deer, how they are going and grazing all my trials. This is a good indication, but uh, I don't have uh, data yet. But this is a legume that will be adapted to uh, flatwood soils in Florida. With that, thank you for your attention, and I don't know if there is time. Thank for you very much, Esteban. We have two minutes for questions. Yes. Uh, 
yes. Um, so the question is, how is the prediction model decay over time? I think the answer will be similar. This is our first cycle. Uh, so we are now, as Matt mentioned, we are selecting individual plants to create the second cycle. Um, I think the idea is to also try to do some across programs models, uh, but we haven't done that with, with uh, Charlie yet. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, no grazing, I mean, just, just cutting. There are one or two lines that we cut three times, which is very promising. Second question, quick one. Mule versus tissue based style in terms of quality, like digestibility? Uh, no, uh, the digestibility will, Tifton is really hard to beat. Uh, so it's, I would say, I think digestibility was similar. I think Newell had a little bit more crude protein, but, but not really a huge difference. Right, but, but I, yeah, I think our approach is, you know, in, in the first cycle of the selection. I don't think we will still be running variety trials later with the selected lines, so we will be collecting a lot more, so, but maybe, yes, in the, in the first cycle we might be missing, but by using genomic selection, you also decrease the risk of doing that because you are using molecular markers. Okay, yeah. thank you very much, Esteban. Sure. So our next speaker is uh, Rafael Reino. The title of his presentation is uh, Use of Genuine Sources of Ergot Resistance in Species of the Dilatata Group of Paspalum. You will have more time because our next speaker is not here, so <laughs> please go slowly. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, thank you everybody for, for coming here, uh, and thank you to the organizing committee for, for giving us the, the chance to, to, show, to show you this, this work. I am Rafael Reino. I am a forage breeder from the National Institute of Agricultural Research in Uruguay. And with me today, I, I'm just part of a team with Dr. Docanto, who is here in the room, and Dr. Dalla Risa, who is, the, who is leading this, this group. And I'm going to talk about the use of genuine uh, sources of ergot resistance in, in the species of the dilatata groom, especially in, of Paspalum. So here is where Uruguay is. is. We are south in South America, just in case someone is, is not aware where we are. And in a, in a very early description of our ecosystem, I, I, I like to, to bring this uh, quote from Charles Darwin book, and he says he, he um, described our, our ecosystem as a very green turf and abundant in, in forage. And nowadays, we still, this is an overview of our, na our natural grasslands, we are still having above 70% of uh, native grasslands, uh, which is around 11 million hectares. And there is a really complex mixture of C dominated by C4 grasses, but we also have 33 grasses and some legumes. But we have several Paspalum species, and among them, Paspalum dilatatum is one of the main ones uh, because uh, it's uh, agronomic traits, so forage production, forage nutritive value, and grazing tolerance. But it's not everything good. We have problems with that. So uh, we have a uh, special Paspalum dilatato, which is, is known as a dilis grass. It has some limitations for in seed production, seed quality, due to its susceptibility to ergot. Um, unfortunately, there is not enough uh, ergot tolerance uh, diversity found in, in dilis grass and in other species of, of the Paspalum genus. And little progress was done uh, for this trait. So ergot is a fungal uh, disease caused by Clavicet paspali. 
uh, attacking young uh, grass ovaries and produce a secretion called as honeydew, containing conidia. The conidia is the way that the fungus infects new plants and, and also is full of alkaloids that could be uh, harmful for, for animal performance. And the sclerotia is the reproductive way of the, of the fungus and replace the seed. So as a conclusion of this thing, the effects on paspaldum are really severe and we have a serious restriction for seed production, low fertility rate and seed yield. But in, in early studies, uh, really early studies, uh, paspaldum malacophyllum uh, was considered as a potential source of uh, ergo resistant that was uh, mentioned by Glenn Barton in 1943, and the first uh, work performing hybrids, interspecific hybrids between Paspalum dilatatum in, in its pentaploid form and Paspalum malacophyllum uh, were done by Bennett and Basham in 1960, and they were successful in bringing immunity or high resistance to ergot in the hybrids. So I'm, I'm Bring in a couple of tables from those early works. In the in the first one, Bennett and Basho describe the two parents that they use for the for the crosses, the Paspalum dilatatum and Paspalum malacophyllum and the F1s. And when they talk about ergot reaction, Paspalum dilatatum was highly or completely susceptible. Uh, Paspalum malacophyllum was immune, and the F1s were highly resistant. And after after that, they describe three F two plants and the same thing. So two of them were immune and one was highly resistant. So based on this previous work, our objective was to valorize the native species of the genus Paspalo by improving one of the main restrictions for its cultivation for, for, for commercial development. And we have three specific objectives that were to test the ergot immunity in Paspalum malacophyllum to local strains of Clavisus paspali in a, in, a find to, in a way to find genuine sources of uh, resistance, create interspecific hybrids by crossing Paspalum dilatatum with Paspalum uh, malacophyllum. We, we use two different uh, ecotypes of Paspalum dilatatum. One is an, an facultative apomictic uh, exaploid and the, the other one is an, uh, a sexual tetraploid. And uh, finally, to develop markers uh, who help us to recognize uh, the hybrid nature of the progeny. So the first work that we did that was done by Hector Oberti, a former student in, in Dalla Risa's lab. He, he performed a collection of uh, claviceps in, in from different species of Paspalum and from different parts of the country and it's, it's very small, the, the, the figure, but uh, mo uh, the, the, the total of the strains collected, isolated from Paspalum dilatatum, uh, were fit in the, in the Clavis of Paspali species, but there were some strains collected from different Paspalum, uh, Paspalum called Plicatulum, that uh, could be a different species into the, into the Claviceps genus. So and another, another thing that he did, he using molecular markers, he proposed an a alkaloid profile for each one of these strains. And finally, this work, part of this work was uh, also propose a, a new draft uh, genome for, for Clavis Paspali. So with having these isolations, that was the first way that, the first time that we can handle um, Claviceps in, in isolation and um, reproduce them to, to inoculate plants at the greenhouse. We uh, evaluate 10 accessions of Paspalum malacophyllum. We started to evaluate them at the, at the greenhouses with the isolations that we have. And then we move uh, to a next step to evaluate them at the field, trying to push them in a, in a broader uh, inoculant uh, environment. You know, you know, maybe there were some isolation that we, uh, some other strains that we, we cannot collect in our early work. And that was, uh, that was done in five uh, different regions of the country. So at the end of the story, nine out of the 10 accessions of, Malaco, of malacophyllum were immune to the, to the ergot, 
and at the same time, all of our dilatatum checks were highly susceptible, completely susceptible. So, uh, with this information, we uh, develop our cross scheme and hybridation uh, identification. So we cross Fasphalum dilatatum, called Chiru, is a is a is a variety name. It's an apomictic, facultative apomictic exaploid with with three different accessions of Fasphalum alacophilum that we select based on agronomic traits, and we did the same for the sexual the tetra the tetraploid sexual of the Fasphalum. We also use 15 molecular markers and 14 functional markers uh, associated with immunity to, to be able to recognize the, the hybrid uh, origin in the, in the progeny, and we also perform flow cytometry. And we did more than uh, 5,000 crosses, and the rate fertility was not too good, but was very close to the same that obtained by Bennett and Bashout and Borson in, in later, in later uh, works, and the germination rate was even lower. The, one of the main difference was, if you see this here, the three, the three in the top uh, are crosses using as a female the facultative apomictic, and the three at the bottom are the the one using a, as, as the mother the sexual, the tetraploid sexual dilatatum. So there were some difference in the, in the numbers of the fertility rate and some other difference in the germination rate, but as I told you before, um, those germination rates were similar to those obtained by Bennett and Basha and, and Barson and Hersey. So then we start trying, okay, we have some seeds, we have some putative hybrids, let's check them. And this is the flow cytometry, the DNA content for the parents that we use in the, in the crosses. The two dilatatums are in the, in the top, are in the bottom, and the three malacophilums are in the middle. And this is a table that expected um, DNA content and, and infer genome formula based on if the during the pollinization, there were reduced gametes or unreduced gametes involved in, in, in that cross. So there's a bunch of things that could happen inside those, those crosses. And let me uh, just talk about one of those. The, this cross, the cross 11, that was a cross done by Chiru and 797, one of the, this malacophilum. The observed DNA content was very high compared with the parents and was close to the expected one for an octoploid. That means that in the dilatato was uh, poly, uh, the, in the hybrid, there were uh, unreduced gamete on the scone. Thank you. So going deeper into this specific cross, um, we found also some markers identifying the malacophilum parent that were present in this cross 11. And this is the, the genome uh, that we infer, so the, the six, the six, um, um, the, the, the whole group of the, coming from the, the dilatatum uh, chiru, used as a, as a female, and two of the, the 
she knows uh, came from the from the parent of the malacophyllum parent. And in order to check this, we perform chromosome counting. So here is again the chromosome, the cross 11, and we count uh, 80 chromosomes that is in, in agreement with our infer um, chromosome numbers based on the DNA content. And we also found some uh, crosses with 50 chromosomes, which uh, means that the uh, reduced gametes were involved in this, in this cross. So this is uh, just a picture of showing how the, this is the, the dilatatum parent, and this is the two putative hybrids, or hybrids confirm that uh, they really close to the, the dilatatum, the dilatatum uh, plant, so and also it looks like some heterosis are expressing in terms of the number of racemes per inflorescence and some other traits. So as just as a final comment, this is an ongoing project. Still, we are still analyzing seeds, putative plants, and evaluate them. So we were able to, to several uh, Clavis paspalis strains have been isolated and are being used for indoor inoculation that was it was great for us because we can handle the, the fungus in, in the way that uh, can allow us to, to, to do a lot of job in greenhouse in, in under control um, conditions. And immune reaction to ergot has been confirmed in Paspalum malacophyllum. This is great because uh, the previous work was done with different strains and we, we didn't know the, the performance of, of, the, of those this species and those accessions under our local strains, but also at the field conditions. And interspecific crosses uh, between dilatatum and malacophyllum are possible. It's, it's an, um, we, we, we were able to obtain them. And the cross 11 is an, is an octoploid and could be considered the result of fertilization of unreduced gamete. This, this uh, could be important for for expressing uh, the whole productivity of the dilatatum plant, but hopefully bringing some resistance from the malacophyllum species. So this is this is still running. So we are uh, we have hybrids that are being inoculated right now and are being evaluated, and the F1 plants are, are also being harvested to evaluate the F2 plants. So we have a lot of work to do in order to, to reach something that could be valuable for, for our producers and farmers, for our environment as well. So thank you everybody for your attention and you are welcome to visit Uruguay and to see our native grasslands. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Rafael. <laughs> so for those of you that ha have just arrived here, our next speaker is not here. So we will take more time for questions for Rafael. Questions, please. No yet, no yet, Ken. We are we are just harvesting the the F1 seeds. So we are trying. We some of our lab mates went to Carlos Acuña's lab in Corrientes to get trained into watching uh, embryo sacs. So we are, he, he did a great show, he did a great show with uh, helping us with that. So we are, we are in that process. Well, you must excuse, right? you must excuse. <laughs> so you're, you're curious in that that takes us away. Uh, yeah. Uh, the DNA content is lower than the malacophyllum, but it gets us away. Yeah. How could we explain that? Well, the, the, there are different genomes, so it's just, smaller. they're just a smaller, yeah. Okay. yeah. More questions? Uh, Alan. Alan? The quick answer is we don't know yet. <laughs> yeah, we, we have. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Also, Carlos Acuna helped us with that. The fertility was uh, how much seeds, seeds we collect from the crosses that we made. And the germination rate was how much 
germinates from the seeds that we get. Where could be, it is, it is possible, yeah. We, we didn't, go, we didn't um, go through embryo rescue because all these um, crosses are very time consuming, very low. you have to emasculate every floret. So it's, it's really very time consuming and we didn't went through embryo rescue. We have the, the, the rates are low, but we're the same as expected. So maybe if we, if we get familiar with the handling the plants and maybe going into embryo rescue, we can get it higher numbers. But More questions? Alan. It is a sex, yeah, it's, it's it, it was mentioned like a, an apomictic, but um, in, 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 other, in other literature, it's, it was mentioned like an, a self, sexual self. Please. Well, the, the, the yellow anthers is, is, is involved with this, is the fluorescence, it was involved but since we, we think that the exaploids have more potential, or agronomic potential for the first production, we start working with the first one, uh, at the beginning with the, with the exaploids, we have some seeds to, to, an, to analyze from the sexual yellow anther deal at that one. So we have, have a lot of work, yeah. More questions? If not, please give an applause to Rafael again. Thank you. So we still have 10 minutes left. Perhaps we, we can take the, the opportunity to, to ask more to Esteban and Matt about uh, phenotyping and genomic selection. Is there any questions or comments in the audience? No? Okay, so we will wait 10 minutes, please.
Okay. Please have a seat. I welcome our last speaker, Eric Billman, and the title is Breeding Forage Grasses for Increased Heat Tolerance. Please go ahead. Good morning, everyone. Uh, sorry, can everyone hear me without me being this close to the microphone? All right. Uh, ah, thank you. Um, Good morning, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to attend this last talk this morning. I'm sure everyone's hungry. I'll try and get you out of here as quickly as possible. Um, today I'll be sharing with you some uh, findings that was actually done during my dissertation work at Mississippi State um, that's still being carried out and since I've moved on, but we're looking at doing some other things with it where I'm at with the USDA in uh, South Carolina right now. Um, so uh, with that, we'll jump right into it. So uh, just for the international audience in here, um, in the U.S., cool season forages really provide a desirable source of uh, nutritive value and good autumn and spring forage mass in our climate. Um, you can see from this figure here that uh, cool season species are really adapted to the northern part of our country. We have our transition zone where warm and cool season species uh, are grown sort of in tandem with each other. And then the deep south states, especially the southeastern U.S., Cool season species are not predominant whatsoever, and that's, uh, uh, well, sorry, getting ahead of myself. Uh, the annual and perennial species that we use are widely cultivated uh, east of the Mississippi River, and most of those species are comprised of uh, species introduced from Western Europe back during colonial times. So that's tall fescue, orchard grass, perennial ryegrass, uh, for example. Now, as I mentioned, uh, the cool season species suffer from uh, inefficient photosynthetic or uh, inefficient photosynthesis because their C3 uh, photosynthetic pathway prevents them from fixing uh, full molecules of carbon so that they can actually put on biomass. They just sustain their photosynthetic cycle rather than adding biomass. Uh, and as temperatures increase, carbon dioxide is less soluble, which makes that system impossible to actually function the way it's intended. Uh, so generally, this results in cool season species being cultivated in climates that have temperatures that top out around 30 degrees Celsius, which is about 80 Fahrenheit. Um, so in the southeastern U.S., for those of you familiar with our geography and climate, you see that there's a problem there because the southeast is much hotter than the northern part of the country uh, for a good deal of the year. Uh, our environmental conditions predispose those cool season grasses to hot temperatures, and that results in poor uh, establishment and or persistence depending on the type. Uh, cool, uh, cool season annuals suffer from secondary seed dormancy, where if the soil temperature is too hot, they just don't germinate even if the temperature is above their normal germination thresholds. Uh, and if perennials are tried to be, if you try to grow perennials, they suffer from poor uh, stand persistence under hot temperatures. And you'll note from this American Horticulture Society figure here, we have uh, heat zones, 7, 8, 9, 10, et cetera. And with zone 8, where we conducted this work in the light yellow in northern Mississippi and going all the way to where I'm at in northern South Carolina, uh, that's anywhere from about a quarter to a third of your calendar year that you're experiencing temperatures in excess of uh, 90 degrees Fahrenheit, um, which is a large problem. And uh, that makes those soil temperatures much too hot to uh, allow secondary dormancy to be broken. So with the breeding trials that we conducted, we looked at two candidate species. One was annual ryegrass to try this with an annual. Uh, annual ryegrass, or Lolium multiflorum, is uh, widely grown in the southeastern U.S., especially in the Gulf Coast states for beef cattle forage. And it's the primary feedstuff for most of those systems during the uh, fall, winter, and spring. And it has a very high rate of gain in cattle and high rate of biomass accumulation for relatively low inputs, which makes it easy to manage. Uh, traditional growth curves of ryegrass look something like this, where we would plant, say, in the mid to late fall in the south, and it grows a little bit and then uh, slows down uh, during the winter. It doesn't have true dormancy, but it does slow down as temperatures cool and then spikes again in the spring. What we proposed to do was try and shift the planting date about six to eight weeks earlier so you can plant in the late summer months when those soil temperatures are still very hot. Um, and that would allow the biomass accumulation to climb prior to winter, allowing you to possibly graze earlier either in the fall or winter or sooner in the uh, spring months and possibly produce total, more total forage. 
uh, with orchard grass, our perennial uh, analog for this. Uh, orchard grass is popular primarily in our northern states here in the U.S., uh, and it has very vigorous and rapid regrowth potential following grazing or cutting events, uh, but, uh, and its maturity mainly coincides with alfalfa production, which makes it useful for uh, integrated forage systems. Uh, but in the southeastern U.S., it simply can't survive the temperatures, at least not on a widespread scale. Uh, a high percentage of that stand dies off, and even if you get some tillers that survive, um, the ones that do generally, it's make one or two or three tillers per plant, it's not enough to survive and produce a viable crop the subsequent year. Um, again, orchard grass's growth curve is bimodal with what we in the U.S. colloquially call a summer slump where it peaks in the spring, uh, slows down a lot because of its C3 photosynthesis in the summer, and then spikes again a little bit in the late uh, fall or winter. Um, but in the southeast, what happens is this red curve where it behaves more like an annual or at best a biennial, where it may only last two years at most. Um, so on an even more challenging basis, we uh, are looking at a trait at heat tolerance that is quantitative, and uh, because of that, it's governed by uh, many genes at multiple and unknown loci because these species are not uh, mapped genetically. And uh, that creates a large G by E interaction, which creates uh, exponential variance where we don't know if the phenotypes we're observing are associated with either our um, uh, selections that we're doing or from the environmental conditions that they're grown in. So what we propose to do is use growth chambers to do our screenings in, which would pretty much lock our environment at a fixed level and then allow us to make selections and determine that any gains from selection are purely genetic in nature. So our objectives for this work were to do uh, growth chamber assisted recurrent phenotypic selection on annual, and orchard, annual ryegrass and orchard grass and uh, try to improve their germination at high temperatures. And we hypothesized that that would, or sorry, our objective was to eliminate secondary seed dormancy, improve the heat tolerance of those seedlings post germination and assess orchard grass's persistence over multiple years. And we hypothesized that recurrent selection in the manner I just described would reduce secondary seed dormancy. Um, growing those seedlings at high temperatures would simultaneously reduce or will increase their heat tolerance as adult plants, and the persistence of the perennial orchard grass would also be improved. So with our screening methods, we looked at uh, primarily simple recurrent phenotypic selection back in, uh, started back in 2015. Uh, this involves mass screening of seed just on germination paper where we're uh, looking at uh, very binary, either they germinate or they don't. It makes a selection for us very easy when we're trying to screen thousands and thousands of seedlings um, for the ability to germinate at 40 degrees Celsius. Our growth chamber was set at a very intensive selection pressure, 40 degrees Celsius, which is about 103 Fahrenheit uh, for 12 hours, and then at nighttime we set it down to 30, which is around 80 Fahrenheit. So it's much hotter than you'd see in real life circumstances. Uh, and then we took those selections and continued to grow them in that growth chamber environment for another two to three weeks to make sure they didn't die as soon as they germinated, which is something that was happening. Uh, to walk you through the general theory of this, here's a normally distributed population where our, say, our uh, population germinates at an average uh, mild temperature, we would select a very small portion of the population out at this extreme end that germinates at high temperatures. The next cycle of selection would then have mean germination that's slightly higher than the previous cycle, and then we would rinse and repeat that several times to advance each cycle. Once we had uh, cycles of selection each year that we were conducting this, we'd move these uh, selections to polycross nurseries in the field. Uh, this is an example that we had here. Um, and then we also carried a block of unselected parental germplasm for each species uh, to do phenotypic comparisons and uh, germination comparisons later on. Uh, the persistence of that orchard grass was also closely monitored in that field condition. Um, once we had harvested and conditioned that seed, we would look at the uh, germination of these species under AASA seed testing protocol so that we could determine uh, our actual gains from selection year over year. And those AASA methods would call for six reps of 100 seed. Uh, so we're doing this for each cycle of selection and testing an identical environment as what our initial growth chamber selections were done in. And the, uh, we were looking primarily at the mean cumulative germs, so summing it 
throughout the duration of these tests for each of the uh, species. And we also looked at the velocity of germination within the first eight days because we want to see that not only are we increasing germination, but we also want to see how fast we can make those seeds germinate so that when they do get water, they're actually germinating and not sitting underground and then drying out again. Uh, statistically, we analyzed this study as a completely randomized design for our uh, germination trials uh, with PROC GLM with an alpha level of 0 0.05 for significance testing. And then we calculated realized heritability with the equation gain over reach, where gains the number of individuals we uh, viewed to observe to express the trait, which was germination, and reach was always 100 because that was the number of individuals that we previously had selected for heat tolerance. So as I go through the results here, these figures are all largely similar, and I'm going to start with ryegrass. Um, but you'll note that days after seeding, which is the germination testing windows on the x-axis and cumulative germ percentages on the y, for our uh, cycles of selection, we go from cooler colors to hotter colors for the least to most advanced cycles of selection. Um, for ryegrass, also, our testing window was only 14 days, where orchard grass, you'll note, is about a week longer than that. Um, so you see right away that cycle three of selection for ryegrass uh, germination at high temperatures, again, this is 40 Celsius, is significantly higher to a proportion of about 40 percent based on what our initial population was here in the blue. And this is an exponential increase uh, year over year. Not only are we uh, increasing total germination, and it's very early on in that uh, um, testing window, but we also are increasing the rate of germination substantially. It's about an eight-fold increase based on the slope of these lines of 0.77 to 8.0. And then we go uh, with orchard grass, um, a very similar situation, just again out to 22 days, um, with a more bimodal versus linear curve compared to ryegrass. And again, another uh, eight-fold increase in rate of germination. In terms of heritability and stand persistence, um, both species had about a 0.4 uh, to 0.45 total heritability, uh, and we expect that to increase with further cycles of selection. With perennial uh, persistence of orchard grass, we saw a doubling going from cycle one to cycle two, but it kind of tapered off after that. Uh, we're not really sure why that occurred. Uh, so in terms of interpreting these results, uh, we saw that we had improved germination when the soil temperatures exceeded the critical threshold for secondary seed dormancy in ryegrass, and that potentially allows us to plant that seed earlier um, and establish it under higher temperature conditions. With orchard grass, it's important to note that cycle three under high temps germinated at a level comparable to unselected orchard grass at regular testing temperatures at 20 Celsius, uh, and that means that stand survival, or, and that we also increased our stand survival, which removes some barriers to entry and shows that selection for heat tolerance does improve stand survival. Um, and our calculated heritability values also show that we're progressing towards fixing that trait with each generation. So in conclusion, um, recurrent selection is a viable method for increasing uh, heat tolerance in these species, provided that you control the selection environment very closely. Uh, with ryegrass, we removed uh, barriers to planting earlier for producers, and for orchard grass, we've uh, shown that with improved survi uh, stand survival, we've also removed barriers to adoption of that species in climates where it hasn't historically been cultivated. In terms of future work, uh, my colleagues, uh, Dr. Morrison, who those of you are at the beginning will uh, note, might have mentioned this, we're working on finalizing the PVP testing uh, phase for this. Uh, for both species. For the ryegrass, we have some seed company interests in that germplasm, and extensionists in Kentucky are also interested in the orchard grass. And I'm taking some of the ryegrass material and testing it under drought conditions in the southeastern coastal plain right now, um, just because our soils are so sandy and we really didn't, didn't screen for drought during this process. Um, and this work's also been published in uh, Crop Science. Um, I meant to put the titles and forgot, uh, but both uh, species have been published there in the last couple of years, and it, it, I'd like to thank uh, the Mississippi Experiment Station for funding this research and uh, the uh, Alternative Crop Breeding Lab at Mississippi for carrying this on once I was uh, done with it a few years ago, and I'll take any questions. Thank you. We have time for two questions. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, the question was, did we see any negative trait association? I didn't have the time to go into that here because I was already whirlwinded, but um, there were some I issues with maturity going a little earlier in both species, but it was hard to tell because we would grow the selections in the greenhouse after that, and this was being transplanted in the fall, if it was due to issues with causing induced vernalization, possibly <laughs> earlier on than what you would get if they were in the environment all year round, because we would grow them and then transplant them around August or September before it's before the fall equinox. So we'd see very abnormal uh, maturities. Sometimes we'd get seed head emergence on the orchard grass in February, for instance. So, um, but we didn't see any other real issues other than that. But we did not ever measure um, biomass yield on these plants. We did not measure forage quality on these plants. Okay. Yes. There was one more question over there. Uh, we did not. Um, just trying to do that with the time resources that I had when we were conducting this, we did not. I, I suspect there would probably be uh, significant effects there, um, and that's something we have seed lots, at least back from my time, that have been frozen for at least five years at this point um, that could easily be measured if we decided we needed to. Esteban? Yeah. So, is that, is that uh, because these, well, so the quest, the statement was, or statement slash question was, we saw increases in germination, but the germ still for ryegrass under 50%. It's not ideal, obviously, and I believe, I wish Jesse was in here to corroborate this, but I believe it was taken to cycle four and five after I finished with it, but I don't know what those test numbers are. Um, I would suspect it would further increase, um, but we observed that as you near 50% in population genetics, it gets harder to push the whole population farther. It can take more years to get smaller gains each cycle. Um, but, uh, but yeah, the, our hope is that we would see around 65 to 70 or 75% germ, and then you could just increase the seeding rate to make up for those uh, lack in germination. Okay. Uh, it's lunch time, but okay. <laughs> T two more yeah, short feel, questions, feel please. Feel free to leave. I'll answer any questions, but feel Derek? free to leave. Yes, yes. So I, d I didn't show that data again. That We tested not only at 40, but at 20 degrees Celsius, and the populations all behave pretty normally under 20 degrees Celsius. Um, but like I said, there's a marked change in these very intense selection pressure compared to the base population. Okay, last question. Uh, they're obligately outcrossing species, so they're completely bred. Just in the crossing blocks, they just wind pollinate between each other, so they're, we could have done a half sib family selection method. We just bulked every plant in that whole population just with more old school bulk selection methods on the entire crossing block. Okay. Thank you very much, Eric. Yep. Thank you. So thank you very much for attending this, uh, this um, part of the conference. It's lunchtime now. Enjoy it.